Thanks for tuning in to the Medivac Podcast, powered by the Robert Irvine Foundation, whose mission is to support and strengthen the physical and mental well-being of our nation's heroes and their families. I'm one of your hosts, David Reed. And I'm your other host, Christian Myers. Thank you very much for joining us on the Medivac Podcast today for a very special Reconnection episode. Today we have General David Goldfein and Chief Master Sergeant Jeremy Hardy for uh, an incredible story. In the uh, late 90s, General Goldfein was shot down in his F-16, and Jeremy was uh, the pararescue man on the team uh, that uh, actually saved General Goldfein's life, rescued him from uh, combat, and they've got a pretty cool serendipitous story where General Goldfein ended up saving Jeremy's life about 30 years later. So welcome, gentlemen. Thank welcome. you very much. Welcome, and if you haven't had a chance to check out Jeremy's past show, we have that on the Medivac podcast as well. So go back, tune in, check that story out to get an overarching view, but we're glad to have you guys together in the same room to talk about not one, but multiple stories of overcoming obstacles in your life and achieving some pretty powerful things and being in this room today. So thank you, gentlemen, for being on the show. Well, you know, I think 30 years later, there's a, at least in the fighter pilot business, we had this rule that a story only has to be 10% true. It's true. Yeah. You know, <laughs> you know the trust but verify and <laughs> embellishing stories, I get it. There is that. Yeah. It's how you get a call sign, right? It only has to be 10% true. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I won't ask how you got yours. Right. <laughs> I know the rules. Yeah. Well, thank you very much for, uh, for being here today, guys. Uh, we'll, we'll dive right in. Uh, we want to... Start the story off basically at, at the start of your deployment in the in the late nineties. So can you talk about the time frame getting spun up when you guys where you guys were headed specifically and what ultimately led up to uh, to the incident? Yeah, what's interesting is uh, there really was no deployment for my squadron because we fought out of home. We okay. fought it from Aviano. Yeah, which uh, you know was never in the brochure, right? Yeah. When you became a squadron commander, because all my experiences up to that point have been you know, fighting from a deployed location. Sure. But Aviano became sort of the USS Aviano for the, it was sort of the, the, the foundational base mm. for that operation. And so we, uh, we fought from home. There was something new. Yeah. I used to call it, you know, mow the grass in the day and get shot at at night. Yeah, it's interesting coming back home after, after going out doing combat missions, coming home, not having that, there's no real decompression in between. And it's something I think they talk about a lot with uh, Predator and, and drone pilots, right? They're off doing operations all day, killing bad guys, and you come home at night. To do a family barbecue. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I typically like to compare it to our first responders as well, right? Mm -hmm. Is that inability to turn that switch off, which you have the luxury of in the military, is you keep everything overseas, you come, ba come back, you com compartmentalize properly, mm -hmm. and then getting back into it, 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 it gets a little bit more of a routine as opposed to just doing a family barbecue after you just could have potentially blown people up. Mm. And uh, the courage of the spouses mm. and the family members was extraordinary yeah. in terms of what they went through. Sending mm -hmm. you off every day. Because they, matter of fact, I'll you know, tell you one quick funny story. So you know, they had told us that uh, if there were locals who were marking your home, there were certain signs to keep an eye on and then we got briefed on things to look for. Mm. And... Uh, there was like a lot of broken branches on the way into your house, uh, uh, paint swipes, you know, that could be nearby. And then one of them was, you know, a dead animal on the doorstep. Interesting. I got back from a combat mission. It's two o'clock in the morning. I walk in, there's this dead crow sitting on my front porch. And where are you at at the time? Aviano. Aviano. I, just, I just come back from a combat mission. Are these local, like Italians, leaving this on your base or are these? So here's how the story goes. Yeah. I race inside, you know, not sure what I'm going to see when I get inside, right? And I'm, I got my wife, my two young daughters. I'm yelling for them, right? They, they all three come in. What? 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 I said, "There's a dead bird on the front doorstep." And we had a little dog at the time. They said, "Yeah, Bella got that. We left it for you to clean up." <laughs> <laughs> oh man, talk this about a heart panic. Girl. Yeah, yeah. That, that, it, did you share that with him as well after? Or? Oh yeah. <laughs> I, I, I had a similar situation uh, after your rescue, um, maybe three, four months. Uh, I got pulled into the T-skiff, and they're like, we want to show you something. And it was a Russian website. It was all in Cyrillic, and it was Andy Kubik 
Ronnie Ellis and myself, we'd been on this media tour doing, just like you were talking about in the previous episode, you were talking about uh, Ted Koppel. And, um, and uh, so, you know, we had done this media tour and there was these pictures of the three of us. It was a wanted poster. And my family at the time, my, my mother and my father, were getting like hang-up phone calls in the middle of the night multiple times a week. And uh, it was all, you know, related to to that. I mean, wow. Yeah, it was. It was. Uh, it was the first time that um, I realized that social media is not as great as it seems. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> <Yeah. laughs> no kidding. That's the start of it. I'm sure. Right. Did you print off that wanted poster? Because I would have hung that up in my office. Uh, I, actually, I, I did. Uh, I, I've since lost it. Um, but I, yeah, I got a, like a 22 by 24. <laughs> I, I had two amazing photographs that I had uh, professionally framed, and one was that wanted poster, and the second was a picture of me and the boss here on my sailboat raising our glasses while a helicopter flew over and took a picture of us sailing. Oh, that's fantastic. And, uh, yeah. I remember that. <laughs> that's fantastic. Um, so wanted posters <laughs> <laughs> and dead birds. <laughs> Gl- glad that it wasn't uh, what you thought it was originally. Amen. Um, so that kind of set the tempo for, for the environment that you were in. Right, it's kind of hostile, kind of extreme. How did that unfold? Uh, well, you know, the campaign itself. Uh, you know, we had trained for months for it, and when it actually unfolded, you know, as a, as a, as a squadron commander at the time, uh, you know, my, you know, unlike day one of Desert Storm, where I was focused on how well I would do as an individual fighter pilot, and you know, now ten years later. I was focused on how well my, you know, squadron would do and whether I had done my job training them and getting them ready because that was my job. Mm-hmm. And my job was to lead them, you know, on, on day one, on day, you name it, right, to make sure that uh, not only we got the job done, but I brought them all home. Mm-hmm. So you guys are operating out of Aviano and you're flying into Serbia, correct? Yes. <clears throat> What's the flight time and, and the distance from there? Obviously, you're hitting a tanker, but... Our average mission was probably about three and a half hours. Okay. Sort of. Um, we know we hit a tanker on the way in, mm-hmm. you know, and we normally always hit a tanker on the way out. Sure. And so uh, about an hour, hour and a half in country. Okay. And so about a three and a half, four hour mission. Okay. Well, that seems pretty, pretty feasible. I mean, you're able to do two or three of those in a day, I would imagine. If uh, you did normally, we'd do a, like one a night, okay. and then I'd you know divide the squadron up into you know who flew nights and who flew days, and try to keep everybody from flip flopping. Yeah, body clocks, sure. right? So you sort of became a night crowd and a day crowd. One of my challenges as commander was I needed to fly with everybody. Mm-hmm. Sure, mm-hmm. and so I did flip flop a little bit more, right, in terms yeah. of days to nights, um, and the missions got longer when we got into uh, more of the you know Kosovo. Uh, fast FAC forward air controller missions. Mm-hmm. Those were a little bit longer because you'd hit a tanker a couple times. Sure, mm-hmm. as you worked other fighters into targets. Yeah, stay on station. As opposed to the you know the single mission going into hit single target. And what are you primarily doing out there? Is it ISR? Is it uh, direct attack? Is it AMC kind of stuff? Airborne mission commander type things? Uh, somewhat all of the above. Okay, but uh, as an F sixteen. Block 40, which was a bomb dropping mm-hmm. precision guided munition uh, platform. Uh, the squadron I was leading was uh, responsible for not only being mission commander for a lot of the missions, but also for, uh, you know, precision strike on, on assigned targets. Okay. Makes and sense. Jeremy, it, while he's doing this, what, what, what is your situation looking like? You know, just to get uh, in theater, um, was a, a fight. So at the time, I was a relatively young pararescuman. I was in team leader upgrade training, so I was considered an apprentice. And when uh, we would call the balloon goes up, um, the decision makers, the commander and uh, the director of operations specifically and the operations superintendent um, are making the decision who goes. And... Um, I'm like, I, I want to go. Like, I, th- this is, you know, this can be my check ride, right? I, I, I want to make this happen. And I had to sit in front of the DO for, you know, an hour with the op superintendent who, uh, a guy named Ernie Evans, uh, one, of, one of my, you know, one of my mentors 
he's like, yeah, he's he's new, um, but he can he can hack it. Mm. Like he can do it. Sure. And the D, I remember the DO, um, uh, you know, Major Sneeder looked at, uh, at at the time, Senior Master Sergeant Evans is like, all right, man, but this is on you. Mm. And so, uh, you know, I, I got to, I got to get in. You know, I got to, and when we got there, um, so we went into uh, Brindisi, which is in southern Italy. Um, and it was just a short flight for us, you know, uh, across the across the, the ocean to get to where we needed to go. Um, and we would um, we would pull alert, um, so we would forward deploy into Bosnia, uh, Tuzla, okay, um, for strike package. So, you know, it was fun. We we go out, put our night vision goggles, and watch. You, know, you could see the, the the lights of the aircraft turn off as they cross the border, they cross the fence, right. Boom, all the lights went out, and they would go, and we would sit alert. Um, but um, it was, uh, you know, it's CSAR, Combat Search and Rescue, is uh, a lot of boredom um, sparked by moments of freaking terror. Yeah. You know? yeah. <clears throat> and that's what we did. We just we, we found a way to kind of make things do. We played video games and cards and uh, did a lot of, you know, dry runs and, and all this kind of stuff, but just waiting you know, um, and about six weeks before General Golfing's incident, um, we had a stealth fighter go down. Uh, F-117, right? Correct, mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, my very first uh, combat rescue mission. Uh, I didn't go on the ground. I stayed in the air doing overwatch and whatnot. But, um, yeah, yeah. Um, so I'm sparked. I'm like, this is this is what it's all about. Like yeah. I got I got, I got the the hunger for what the real that others may live mission was all about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. That's incredible. That's incredible. So at this time, your your things are spinning up. Things are spinning up. You're doing these consistent operations, um, and then how does that unfold? Uh, me ask this because you can you can pull it off of you can edit this later right but the question is do you want me to repeat anything from the last one or sure yeah is it all right yeah, yeah. absolutely okay. absolutely yeah yeah and we can we can cut stuff out here yeah. and there it's not okay. a problem uh so uh, you know because we had our families with us i had uh, told my wife uh, i said listen i can't tell you when we're gonna when we're gonna go because mm -hmm. it's classified i can only tell you when to have a potluck yeah yeah and so when we got the call, it was time to go, that we were going to launch that night on the first mission. I was leading the first mission of the campaign, and uh, I called her and just said, hey, it's a good night for a potluck. Mm -hmm. And um, we, uh, she, all the spouses showed up, and we reorchestrated our departure so we could fly right over my house. Have a good send-off. All the spouses, and I got a chance to go you know, talk to all of them and shared the list of, you know, okay, who was need air, each airplane mm -hmm. as we, you know, 20 seconds apart, full afterburner, loaded loaded for bear, and we all flew over. And uh, that was a pretty special moment, I think, for the squadron as a family. Yeah. Right? Uh, because I had a chance to talk to all the spouses before we went, and I said, hey, your, your husbands are ready. You know, at that point, sure. it was all men. You know, I'm glad we fixed that now, and so now it's a much more, you know, mixed uh, group, but... I said, here, husbands are ready to go, and I'm going to bring them home. And mm -hmm. so that's how it all started. Mm -hmm. And what was next steps? And then we you know, got into a battle rhythm. And the battle rhythm was uh, flying. You know, We had sort of divided the squadron up into you know, who was flying nights, who was flying days, so we didn't flip-flop them too much sure. on body clocks. And then so I, I, I spent my time mostly on the night schedule because that was the hardest. Those were the hardest missions to fly. And... I'd had an experience in Desert Storm that uh, was instructive. So my boss at the time, Vietnam veteran Billy Deal, led every mission for the first 30 days. And then he pulled us all in one day and said, listen, he goes, you, you know, there'll be a lot of medals and recognition when this is all over. He said, but there's going to be something that I'm going to do for you that, uh, that, that is my gift to you. He said, I'm going to fly on every one of your wings on a combat mission. And I'm going to call it, a, and we're going to, it's going to be a check ride. And you're going to get a Form 8, which is the form, check ride form. Yeah. Signed by me. 
on a combat mission in your flight record. He said, that'll mean a lot to you because the one I have for my mission in Vietnam that my squadron commander did for me, he goes, I'm going to do it for you. And he did that for me. Wow. Now is my chance to do it for my guys. Mm -hmm. Hey, boss, I I heard a rumor that um, your wingman, who was on scene commander, uh, that that was an OSC check ride for him. It was a check ride. So uh, that's the night that uh, that I was hit. I'm flying as number four, and I'm given my flight lead, uh, Captain Adam Jammer Kavlik, uh, a check ride. And um, and so uh, while I led in the first 30, 40 days, by the time it got to the you know, second of May. I was flying mostly on the wing. And it, and it also felt good because I was also, you know, showing the young flight leads I had and that I had full confidence in them to go up and lead the squadron and lead other squadrons in, you know, combat missions. Man. So how, how do you feel during this? Like, obviously, this is a culmination of years of, you know, year training, and it's, it's all coming to to its apex, essentially. What, what's going on in your head personally? Well, you know, as a squadron commander, you carry a little bit different burden. Mm-hmm. Again, it's not so much about how you will perform. It's how, how well you have trained your team to perform. Yeah. And I just remember being incredibly proud of, uh, of the level of performance I was seeing. Um, how everybody was, was not only, you know, at, at, uh, approaching the mission itself, in terms of the details with which we planned, uh, the the sophistication of the execution, all of that, but because there were two squadrons that were home based at Aviano, five tenth and five fifty fifth, triple nickel and the buzzards, mm-hmm. we were sort of the two lead squadrons for all the deployed forces. Mm-hmm. So, for instance, this, like the strike eagles from Lake and Heath, they they operated out of my squadron. Okay, and you know we we built you know we actually built out an area for them. And from the beginning, I sat down with the squadron commander and said, listen, uh, there's, no, there's no hierarchy here. You know, we're family. They we're doing this for, for, you know, together, right? Yeah. And so we just mixed as two squadrons. The buzzers did the same thing on the other side of the ramp. Um, and so I was really proud of that. Matter of fact, the, uh, uh, we look back now and determine it. It was not a low-calorie war <laughs> because our spouses made uh, meals for <laughs> the entire uh, group every night of the campaign. Wow. They would bring out and set up. And so for both the, you know, the strike Eagles and the triple nickel, you know, we were always, we were always, there wasn't a mission we flew on that was not well fed. <laughs> it's good. You need a, you need a full belly, right? For combat effectiveness. So let's paint the picture a little bit about that night. So from the mission briefing um, onwards, how did that look? No real change to the mission brief. Can I'm on the wing? I'm given a check ride. Thought the briefing went well. Uh, you know everything on the on the mission itself. You know the the overall mission we were on was to change the cost curve for the Serbians on shooting at NATO forces, mm. because while we were in Kosovo, not much shooting going on in Serbia. They shot at us every night, and to date, we had not effectively taken out the shooters or taken out the command center. Right, so they were shooting almost at no cost. We wanted there to be a cost. Sure. Because we didn't know long this campaign was going to go on. And we didn't feel like we can continue to you know, jink and jive every single night. So we developed a tactic between the bomb droppers and the, the seed suppression of enemy air defenses, the ones that are shooting high, you know, the anti-radiation missiles, mm-hmm. where we would, uh, we would chart our course outside the lethal radius of these sites. But if they shot, that launch area would be the hottest thing on the ground in our night vision goggles. Sure. And there's no way they could cool it. Mm -hmm. So they just gave away their position. And so the tactic was just sort of stay outside of lethal range, but get them to come up, you know, with their emissions that we could guide in on and then shoot something that allow us to rein in precision guided weapons. The 
my my squadron was the Precision Guided Weapons Squadron. So we teamed up with a squadron from Han at the time and Shaw, and we're going in that night. And so, you know, we're on our way in. All of a sudden, we uh, we see what we expected to see. Got uh, surface-to-air missiles coming at us. Uh, we're calling them out. I'm looking up. MVGs, I can see arms in the air, raining in on them. I'm now looking down into my, you know, scope and my targeting pod, try to pick up the sight, while at the same time maneuvering the airplane based on the missiles I saw. And as the, like the history of most shots that get you, the one I didn't see is the one that got me. Mm-hmm. And it turns out uh, this, uh, the one particular Serbian battery commander, um, Zoltan, I believe his name was. Uh, by the way, same guy who got the 117. No we, he, he got Yeah, he got a call sign, MacGyver, right? Because he rewired his system and moved it underneath our flight path, and he shot right from below. No kidding. Wow. And so the one that hit me you know, only took about five to seven seconds from launch to impact. Wow. And where to hit? Back end. Back and end. L- luckily, tail. Uh, tail and... Uh, uh, Far enough back that I still had control of the airplane, even though it was, you know, coming apart sure. somewhat. But um, and far enough back that didn't uh, didn't didn't really hit me. Had small shrapnel in my uh, hand, but other than that, um, you know, no real issue. Was that uh, IR guided or was that uh, no? You know? uh, I'm sure radar guided. Radar guided. Okay. So when when you get hit, can can you describe that moment? What the? So you're flying along. It's nighttime. You've got NVGs on. You're you're focused down on. On your targeting pod, when that explosion happens, is is this loud, overbearing? Are you thrown? Were you expecting it? So interest, interestingly enough, uh, I had gotten hit by lightning about a month prior. Okay, so similar, I would imagine. In an F sixteen, <laughs> and it was on my recovery in Daviano, and you know it was a loud, huge explosion, yeah. bright white, lit up the cockpit, and then you know at that point, now you start doing your assessment of, okay, what's, what do I still have? What yeah, have I lost? Yeah. So the best I can describe it is it felt just like that. Okay. So in some ways, you know, it was nice that I'd had the previous experience to get ready for this one. Yeah. Now yeah. the difference was uh, all of a sudden the airplane uh, went from, you know, being able to be fully recovered safely like it was after lightning strike to starting to come apart. So, you know, I had shaking, smoke in the cockpit, yeah. you know, loss of the engine, yeah. uh, which I tried to restart several times and as I was, you know, gliding towards what I was hoping was a safe area, you know, it became pretty clear to me that I was the most, the world's most expensive glider. Yeah. And uh, that airplane was going to hit the ground. The only question was whether I was going to be in it. Hmm. So, so you, last episode, you mentioned that when you get into that cockpit, you have this, this just focal vision, this, this confidence. You're not overthinking. You're just kind of utilizing that muscle memory, if you will. Um, how, how did that change? How did your demeanor or focus change when that hits, right? Is there panic that goes on at the first initial thought? Uh, just complete confusion? Like, walk me through what you're feeling. Well, originally I thought, uh, I thought okay, uh, I'm okay, right? I mean, I had some pain in my right hand. I looked down. Um, you know, I'm not sure whether I'm going to see a bloody stump, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah. You can relate, yes. right? And, uh, and so I do the digit count. <laughs> you know, and say, okay, all right, it's all still there. And now I'm I'm focused on the, you know, what do I have left? Yeah. Right? Analyze the situation, mm-hmm. right? What, is, what, is, what do I have left? And I thought originally I have a motor until I pushed the engine up and nothing. Um, and, you know, I make a radio call, uh, I think to, you know, sense, you know, tell my, you know, flight that I've been hit. I'm headed back towards, you know, Tuzla, or at least towards Bosnia. And, um, you know, I would say that there's, you know, emotions-wise, it's more of a uh, all your training kicks in. So you're sort of going through this methodical, okay, what do I have? Do I have an engine? Yep. I don't. Okay, I got to restart that engine. All right, so that's that was sort of all my focus. Yeah. You know, where am I? Well, the, all the gauges are shaken. I can't tell what I am. Okay, let's not worry about that anymore. Right. Let's just focus on getting a motor. Right. So, I mean, all my focus was on getting uh, an engine restart. So I did about two or three engine restart attempts and nothing. Okay. Right? Mm-hmm. And then more vibrations, more, you know. And so now it's a matter of, okay, I'm shifting from, uh, 
you know, getting this thing restarted to finding a good place to get out. Yeah. So now I'm focused more outside, looking at the train, looking at where the villages are, pointing the airplane away from villages, you know, and then trying to trying to determine when's the best time to get out. What altitude are you at around then? Um, I got out at around two to three thousand feet. Okay, so fairly low. And I and I say that uh, having no data behind that. Sure, it's just sort of based on what I remember in terms of my time in the shoot. Okay. And uh, so from the time you're shot, you go through all your checklist procedures, trying to restart the engine till ejection. How long is that? Uh, uh, you know, I don't know how long it is in terms of time. I can tell you it's, it's, it's from 19 to 3,000 feet. Okay. So, so, I'm, so that, that airplane minutes. took great care of me. Yeah. So you had a few minutes to work through the issue yeah. then. Yeah, but that bird was my flagship. Mm. Had a beautiful hand-painted crew chief had painted a falcon on the tail. Yeah. Had my name on the canopy as the commander. And she took great care of me mm. up until the end. And I remember in the shoot, you know, watching her hit and explode yeah. and being just so thankful that it was in a forested area and no, no village nearby. Sure. Yeah. I, I think what's really remarkable about the whole situation is, you know, a very easy internet search for Hammer 3 4 shoot down. And there's this HUD video and the general talking through this from hit to. You know, the, the, the famous line, start finding me, boys, and pulling the handles. And there wasn't a mark of distress or panic or it, just cool, calm, collected. All right, guys, this is what's going on. Hey, stop stop telling my position right now. Okay, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a glider, boys. The, the, the whole aspect from... from the hit of the SA-9 to pulling those handles was like you would think he was in a simulator, just talking through, mm -hmm. you know, uh, a, a, you know, a, a scripted scenario. It was uh, just remarkable. I just got that from all my PJ buddies, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that right? You, you know, it's like the old duck on a surface, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so while you're, underneath. while you're under that canopy, now you got to be thinking of you know, prisoner of war type situations, back to your childhood a little bit. Um, like, what are you thinking when you land? Yeah, I didn't have any time for that. Yeah. So I, I, I get out and your, and your training just kicks in, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, so, I, hey, I went through, uh, I went through you know, parachute and survival uh, training, all that stuff in 19, you know, 79. I got shot down in late 1999. I'll mm -hmm. let you do the math, right? <laughs> we said last time, math's not my strength. Um, there's a way that we all compartmentalize training mm -hmm. and it just is parked in our brains and we call upon when we need it. And when you need it, it's like immediately there. Yeah. So, you know, two elements like came to be, right? First of all, it's that check, like check canopy, right? Get rid of your visor. All, you know, there's like this set things you go through, right? That I'd gotten through, you know, and I'd committed that checklist of memory in <laughs> 1979 and here I was going through it. I look up and I do check canopy and I went, oh, crap. We had packed the wrong shoot. So it's full moon night. I'm supposed to have a dark combat shoot. I've got the white parachute yeah, with the white. orange, <laughs> the orange diamond or the oh, no. triangle. Yeah. Like, so uh, crap was See, not the actual, yeah. actual word I used. Yeah. But uh, I remember, you know, they say it and at night, right? Not supposed to nine, do your four line. You're not supposed to pull them, right? You're supposed to just, right? but at night, and I four lined <laughs> and I grabbed the front riser and just pulled it and just spun. And then the second thing that came to me was, uh, again, another Garth Brooks uh, unanswered prayers, right? So mm. I'd, I'd, I'd wanted to be part of the uh, parachute team when I was a cadet at the academy. But you had to have a 2.6 GPA to pull your own ripcord. <laughs> <laughs> if you had closer to 2.0, a la Dave Golfing, um, <laughs> You got to go to Fort Benning <laughs> and do static line jumping. So here's the unanswered prayer, right? When you're getting your wings, four, jump four is a night combat jump. Full combat gear, low altitude, static line. Mm -hmm. So your computer's is pulled out, right? Minimal time between the time you, uh, and with all of your gear, you got to success, successfully do a parachute landing fall, PLF. And then because the black hats are screaming at you and they're bullhorns, right? You got to grab all your gear and you got to sprint to the buses. Yeah. yeah. Right? You want to pass that ride? You got to do all those things <laughs> yeah. to include the sprint. Well, here I am. Low altitude, night, combat jump, static line, 
sprint to the tree line. Yeah. Unanswered prayer, right? Yeah. I wouldn't have gotten any of that if I'd done free fall parachute training mm. at the academy. I got that all at Fort Benning. So as I'm on my way down, I just remember the uh, black hats, you know, the trainers at Benning yelling, feet and knees together, don't look down. Feet and knees together, don't look down. I'm, and I'm telling myself that, you know, as the ground approaches. And, you know, because the last thing, you know, I needed was to have an injury on landing. Absolutely. Right? Given the fact that crash site just happened, you know, Serbs are going to be out immediately Looking trying to find them. me. Yeah. yeah. And so I needed to move. So I wouldn't say there was a lot of time for a lot of, you know, emotional reflection. Yeah. There was, there was work to do. <laughs> yeah, I think I think that's the whole point is that training just really kicks in and, and you black out and you wake up and you're like, what the heck just happened, <laughs> right? So, so Jeremy, during this time, I'm sure you're on QR or, or standby, right? Um, Correct. What's going on in your talk? Yeah, so um, same thing we did every night, um, you know, when the vol opened. Um, we would uh, we would go to the ready room, and uh, you know this particular night uh, we were playing a video game. I'm not a big video game guy, but you know we we're playing. Um, we talked about this in in a previous episode. Um, uh, Goldeneye. Right? Oh yeah. Right. So we had the four screens. Four of us were, you know, playing video games, and we've got a Satcom radio, a, a PRC one seventeen, you know, and we're listening. And um, then we started hearing, um, the call sign was magic. It was um, uh, kind of the command control aircraft uh, is, is uh, hey, we, you know, we've got, we got to shoot down. And um, I mean, we were it. We, we were the team that was on alert. And so, you know, we go grab our gear and then we're just standing by. We're waiting. You know, we get the, what we call a Tokyo call. We get the Tokyo call to get the aircraft up and running and APU's burning and everything's loaded, ready to go. And then we're just waiting for launch authority. Mm-hmm. And it happened so many, I mean, all, you know, virtually like every other alert cycle, something like this would happen. Uh, and it would end up being, you know, a dry hole. And so we were used to getting spun up and, you know, that's the beauty of CSAR is like, hey, get ready to go. Just kidding. Yeah. <laughs> you know. Yeah. You know. Um, and then we got a launch authority and that changed everything, at least for me. Uh, again, brand new team leader, not even fully qualified as a team leader. And man, we're going in, we're going to get it. Like, this is a real thing. And what's the brief for you? Uh, we knew it was an F-16, uh, surface to air missile, uh, was down in um, what uh, the command and control aircraft had established an ellipse. Uh, the unfortunate aspect was the ellipse went all the way from Beijing, China <laughs> to <laughs> Belgrade, Serbia. Um, so we, it's somewhere here, <laughs> right? So, uh, but we, but we, knew, I mean, you know, based on the vol, based on what we knew, the aircraft going in, coming out, uh, check in and check out. Um, from the fall, we knew that all right, he's in this general area, and um, we got rotors turning, gears loaded up, we're ready to go, and then we launched. When, I mean, it seemed like hours before we got launch authority. You know, and the boss wasn't on the ground. What eight hours, nine hours ish, something like that. Actually, I think only about two, two and a half. Was it real? Uh, well, it seemed like like fifty hours, like. I mean, it seemed like we spent two hours just waiting for launch authority. And that's, yeah. you know, that's that's the feeling with rescue as well, right? Is every single second counts. So you're, you know, amplifying that in your mind. Same thing with when you get hit. I'm sure, you know, same thing when I got hit is we have a tendency to say, wow, that was a lifetime. And you're like, that was two and a half minutes, too. <laughs> you know? Yeah. So, so he's getting spun up. You get launch authority, which is amazing. And at this point, you know, you're thinking, I got to hit the wood line as fast as possible. So you make a successful landing, nothing broken. You do your assessment. Next thought. So it's, uh, you know, get cover. Mm. Sure. And start, uh, because I... And you just uh, have an M9, I'm sure, on you. Or- that's right. Well, interestingly not. <laughs> interestingly, I thought I, I thought I did. And I actually went for it because, uh, you know, after I got to the bottom of this ravine... Uh, with all my gear, because I ran, you know, just like I'd learned at Benning. I grabbed my raft, grabbed all my stuff. I'm sprinting to the tree line. 
I get into the tree line. I think it's going to be a nice, easy shelf, right? Turns out my the ground disappears, and I fall forward on this raft and ride like Indiana Jones, you know, oh, and man. then head plant, you know, at the bottom of the ravine. But luckily, I got my helmet on, right? So still uninjured. Yeah. And so I sort of buried all my stuff, made a quick radio call, and my, you know, Cablick uh, jammer you know, responded immediately. I said, hey, I'm okay. I'm on the move. And uh, I think I made a comment like I'm going data because I, I didn't know how long it was going to take. And I wanted to preserve battery life. And I didn't want to be dis- undisciplined and say something in the radio that would make it easier for the enemy to find me. Absolutely. And I knew it was going to be at least an hour, right? Because I knew where the rescue forces were coming out of. And so my job now was to get to a good position, uh, avoid being captured, and then set up the rescue. Mm-hmm. And so I buried, you know, all the stuff there at the bottom of the ravine. And then I started making my way to what I'd seen. So there was some higher terrain before I jumped out. And all of a sudden I hear voices. And so I hit the deck and laid in this high grass and started slithering where I could, you know, down, back down the ravine. Didn't get too far and then just laid there. And these three guys with, you know, weapons slung over their shoulders uh, um, were walking, and they were part of the search team. And uh, I reached for my nine mil, and that's when I realized that it had escaped during the ejection. Oh no! So, but in the in the grand scheme of things, quite frankly, if I'd had to use it, uh, I would have given up my location. At least I would have given them a vector, absolutely, right, in terms of where to yeah. start heading towards me. So I'm, I'm, for a number of reasons, I'm glad I didn't have to, and they didn't, and they didn't see me. Yeah. And so they just walked by, and I uh, I laid there probably another 30 minutes to make sure that they had, were long gone and hadn't circled back Sure. before then I got up and got on the move. And then the, then the question in my mind was, am I in Serbia or Bosnia? Yeah. Because I, because of the, all the gauges shaking, I, I didn't have a chance to know what my location was before I jumped. Yeah. And because of time compression, you know, in my mind, I thought I'd, I'd glided a lot more than I did. Yeah. Turns out I'm, I'm well inside of Serbia. Okay. But the question for me was, um, what's my greatest threat, the enemy or landmines? Uh. Because I had I had to get to high terrain and get away from the, the wreckage. I was still, I was already about a mile to two miles away, but I knew that that's where they'd start looking. And so the farther I could get from that, the more time I'd have. Wow. And so I uh, just... You use that to evade along tree lines, you know, until I got to a point where I thought, okay, this is going to work. This would be a good place. And you just hunkered down from there? Hunkered down, jump on the radio, and I uh, got the worst radio call of the night. They said, uh, the rescue team's in country and they're looking for you. And I thought, damn, what do you mean looking for me? We had been briefed. I'll be careful in terms of how I, you know, talking this little skiff that you built here, right? <laughs> um, but there was a capability in our new radios that every time we did something, we would send our position. Mm-hmm. And we were told, as long as you do this thing, then you don't have to talk on the radio. They will come get you because they know exactly where you are. Yeah. And that system failed that night. Of course it did. Miserably. Yeah. So we ended up performing... Uh, Pretty close to a Vietnam kind of rescue. It was pretty close. I, yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, you know, going in, like I said, the ellipse was very large. We had a initial hit on where we thought you were. And um, so yeah, as a formation, so we had two MH-53 helicopters. Each helicopter had half a platoon, and half an ODA, a, a Green Beret team, as our quick reaction force with uh, two PJs and a combat controller. And then the uh, MH-60 that I was on was the primary pickup bird because smaller aircraft, we can get in, get out quicker. Um, So as a formation, we're flying around where we initially thought you were. And uh, I remember, you know, looking through my MVGs, I'm hanging out the aircraft because that's what I do. I'm, you know, clipped in, but hanging out. So I've got full, you know, 360 visual and I'm seeing farmers come out with shotguns. You know, lights turning on. Uh, then we started taking 40 millimeter Beaufort fire. Um, and we decided to, you know, leave that area to try and reset. And then that's when we got an update from the command and control aircraft that we were something like 14 kilometers away uh, from where they now thought you were. And so we, 
Yeah, yeah that way. How'd you hone back in on that location? Uh, after they told me that uh, hey, they were, <laughs> yeah. After they told me they were looking for me, uh, for me, I, 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 I reflected back on um, the shoot down and uh, rescue attempt of uh, a buddy of mine, Bill Andrews, during Desert Storm, um, and the Hilo crashed and killed several. Mm. And so immediately in my mind, I thought, okay, I'm, I've screwed something up because I put these guys at risk. And so now it was no longer time to be real stealthy. My job now was to figure out, okay, how do, how do I get this pickup going? Because enemies getting closer. I could see them over the horizon. And it just so happened as I'm talking to uh, Cav Jammer Kavlik and A-10s had shown up as Sandys. Very, very far off in the distance, I heard chopper noise. And so I made a call, something to the effect of, you know, uh, tell them to put the moon at their back and fly 210. And that's only because I'd done my little, you know, compass, <laughs> yeah. you know, Azimuth. on the, <laughs> on the uh, thing, right? And I just closed my eyes and I listened and, okay, they're getting louder. All right. And I said, okay, tell them come east. And the A-10s would lay, come east. I'd listen and I'd hear the drift, you know. I'd say, okay, a little bit more north. A little bit more north, right? So we just, that's why I say it's like a Vietnam rescue. Right? Yeah. So I'm it, just it, it talked them right in. It, 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 it was kind of textbook in that way. And it made it, made it so much, because, I mean, in all the training that I've ever done, you know, we were never trained to have the survivor talk us in. Sure. Right? And and that's exactly what's happening in real time. We are, Our survivor was talking us in. They teach that in SEER school now. Yeah, <laughs> yeah good. Yeah, yeah ve <laughs> vector the aircraft. And if you can hear them, Tell them where to go. Yeah, well, Absolutely. I pick up, I pick up a visual on uh, on all of them, and uh, again, full moon night. Sure, uh, I don't have NVGs anymore, but I didn't need them because mm -hmm. now, in addition to the enemy getting closer, sun's getting closer. Yeah, which is never good. Never good, right? So I'm now the guy that's actually placing everyone at increased risk, mm -hmm. and so you know there was no more like you know stay off the radio or be careful what you say. Anyway, yeah. it was like. Okay, we got to make this happen now, or I'm, you know, hunkering down for at least another day. Yeah. And uh, once I saw him, I had a, I had my uh, IR right light with the camera cover. I ran out, put it down, and then I saw, you know, uh, MH60, you know, boom, turned right on and landed right on top of it. And of course, now uh, they teach you, all right. Be submissive. <laughs> Don't look like you're a threat. Don't hold up a weapon. Yeah. Luckily, I didn't have one. Uh, no, Scott O'Grady. Yeah, I said just <laughs> just let them come get you. Right. Uh, well, enemy sees us now. Races on. Right. They're shooting wildly. You know, uh, in our direction. Uh, Jeremy's the one that I meet. I think Andy's you know off to the right. Ronnie Ellis is off to the left. Right. You had deployed in your formation. I meet uh, Jeremy, and we had to authenticate. And our total authentication was Jeremy looking at me going, let's go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Looks like the right guy. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Still pass the check ride. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, it was, um, you know, we we had uh, we gone through a lot just to get to, to, to that. You know, crossing the border, uh, we took um, three ballistically launched SAMs, so two SA-6s and an SA-9. And the SA-9 actually passed uh, between the the second helicopter and our helicopter. So, um, like we talked about in, in a previous episode, uh, during visual recce each year, I could raise my hand and go, I know what an SA-9 looks like in flight. <laughs> <laughs> Seen it. <laughs> you know, uh, and then uh, on the way to the first location, um, we were flying through a village, and the entire third story of this, building opened up on us. Uh, we didn't realize we were flying past the Serbian Special Police Headquarters. Um, so we were already pretty amped up when we got to that point. Oh, yeah. And, um, and, and just like the boss said, uh, we're flying, we're number three in the formation, and I got the IR strobe, the infrared strobe going off in this small little clearing, and we didn't ask permission. We just broke formation 
and went in. And, you know, at that point, Sandy, which is the A-10s. Um, by the way, uh, Buster uh, Cherry was, uh, I think, uh, Sandy lead. I uh, love that call sign. <laughs> um, uh, and we've, we've, uh, we've uh, kept in touch uh, through social media and whatnot. Um, but uh, Sandy and Flight Lead had already, you know, asked a number of classified questions to make sure that this wasn't a SAR trap or whatever. Um, so it came down to the right person in the right uniform in the right place at the right time. Mm, sure. And uh, as I went up to as I was moving towards uh, the general, um, it felt like uh, somebody was, and, and this didn't register, this is after the fact, but it felt like somebody was hitting the ground um, with a sledgehammer, right? And, um, and I saw these strobe lights in, in the tree line. And I'm like, there's not supposed to be anybody here while there's strobe lights going off. Now, after the fact, that was rounds impacting and those muzzle flashes, you know? So at that point, uh, what do they say at... Um, uh, discretion is a better part of valor, <laughs> you know. Uh, it was at that point we had our precious cargo. It was time to go, and um, it wasn't time to go. What was the color of your first car's <laughs> left wheel, or whatever? You know? Yeah, no time for that. So, yeah. Oh, please go ahead. I was just going to say, all in all, how long were you on the ground? You said a couple hours. I think about. Uh, I think I got one, shot down about uh, one, uh, about between one thirty and two a.m. Okay, and then I think you guys picked me up just before sunset. Just yeah, before sunset, yeah. the sun was rising as we were as we yeah. were flying back. So out. I think yeah. I mean I'm, I don't I don't I don't know if there's any kind of record of the exact timing, but you know just based on when the sun came up because I mean what it wasn't long that sun came up and yeah. we're all looking at each other and I remember Jeremy times looking at, ticking. I think that was when you looked at me and said, "Welcome to Bosnia." I did, I, yeah, I did. Yeah, <laughs> like a movie. <laughs> well, it, it was it did it was so cheesy, but whatever. I mean. <laughs> We just crossed the border, and I put my hand on. I'm like, "Hey, welcome to Bosnia." <laughs> oh, that's great. That's yeah. great. Uh, so, while you guys were taking fire, I wanted to, wanted to ask this: Are you guys returning fire, or are you just avoiding all all combat while you're like in ingressing and egressing from the zone? So we didn't engage the surface to air missiles, sure, um, which is you know a, a, a countermeasure, but we didn't have time. Yeah. Um, you know, it was kind of funny because I had no clue uh, the aerobatics that an MH60 can do <laughs> yeah. when you're janking and chaffing and popping flares and like this. Air, I, I I swear, I know we didn't, but I swear to God, we did like freaking full loops. I oh, mean, yeah. we were, it was crazy. Um, when we got over the village near the MUP headquarters, the Serbian Special Police headquarters, uh, we did uh, our, our right gunner um, engaged. Okay. Uh, engaged the, um, and then when we were on the ground to this day, you know, probably my only regret of the entire night was I didn't dump a mag in the tree line <laughs> yeah. just to say I did, you know. <laughs> Get off um, the chopper. <laughs> <laughs> Survive. Yeah, I was, uh, so, so I personally, uh, well, the three of us are the special tactics team. We personally didn't engage our weapons. Okay. We launched a couple of 40 mic mics sure. out of the helicopter on ingress, but, uh, but that was it. Okay. Gotcha. Yeah, probably best to just pull this guy out and disengage <laughs> as, as fast as possible. So when you, you know, sit in that jump seat and you're you're chilling out, welcome to Bosnia happens, what's going on in your mind? Now that adrenaline crash comes in, I'm sure. Well, so uh, truth be told, where I was finally picked up is not the original site that I picked. So one of the things that happened again during Desert Storm, a buddy of mine, Spike Thomas, got uh, jumped out in Iraq. Successful rescue, six and a half hours on the ground before they picked him up. And I remember debriefing him in the bar, and I said, "Spike, man, how'd you keep your sanity? Six and a half hours, you can see the enemy the entire time. You're in a wadi under your raft." And he said, "Well, fingers, you know." He goes, uh, "I knew I was getting out, so." I'd reach out from under my raft. I'd scoop in the rocks and I'd look at it with my iris, you know, cover on my flashlight. I picked the good rocks for my kids because I wanted them to have super souvenirs from Iraq. <laughs> I remember when he told me that, I thought, man, that's like father of the year. <laughs> yeah, right? Yeah. All right, 10 years later, now it's my turn. So I collected some rocks while I'm waiting to, you know, for the rescue to, to complete. And I hear footsteps uh, in the ravine below me. So I hit the deck again, 
thinking, God dang it. It's two in the morning. Can't believe somebody found me. Turns out to be an animal. So um, I have some of the rocks in my G-suit pocket or in my flight suit pocket. I take the G-suit off. I take some of these rocks and I throw it at this thing and it rears up and it growls at me. And I got to tell you, Jesse Owens couldn't keep up with me. I left that perfect spot. And I'm convinced it was a Serbian, you know, mountain lion or a grizzly bear. <clears throat> My fellow fighter pilots, field mouse. <laughs> <laughs> Serbian field mouse. Cr- Chris and I talked about this yesterday. <laughs> the Serbian field mouse. Yeah. yeah. That's funny. <laughs> and the, what was it, the Benz? Uh, you, you know, when you got the award from the Benz, um, I, you know, I, I was gifted. I was given the opportunity to, you know, talk about general golfing. We was getting this award. And um, I, I had a, a, a Google Earth snapshot of the actual lot long of where he was picked up. And uh, we talked about uh, the fact that it wasn't a vacation destination and it was rife with Serbian field mice. <laughs> <laughs> Just overgrown creatures. Yeah. <laughs> Probably way bigger in your head. <laughs> what was interesting is like when I got on the helo, <clears throat> Jeremy, Andy, Ronnie, they all pushed me to floor and climbed on top because we were taking fire. Mm. <clears throat> we ended up taking about five rounds, I think, mm. yeah. in the helo. One of them like a millimeter or two from a major hydraulic line. In my head at the moment, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and that, that would have caused us to, you know, land and transition, which... Enemy coming at us, you can imagine how difficult that would have been. Absolutely. Um, so these guys, you know, pushed me down to the floor and they were climbing on top of me right, because they got body armor on. I'm just in a flight suit. Just and uh, and uh, I'm thinking, you know, a couple things. Thinking, Man, these guys are big. Man, these guys are incredible, right? Um, and uh, I, you know, I joke with Jeremy and the team all the time. I said, man, uh, all of a sudden I realized, man, we're getting shot at from below. You know, I think I think you I think I was body armor for you. Right? <laughs> yeah, but uh, in actuality, uh, that was the first time I had a chance to really think, man. Oh, man, the, these guys risked everything. Thank God, nothing happened. Yeah. You know, these guys risked everything to get me out, and our nation was not going to sleep that night until I got home. Years later, I was in a you know State Department uh, education class and. We traveled around D.C. and went to various organizations that gave their mission brief. And was, it was amazing to me how many organizations in their mission brief talked about how they helped find the F-16 down pilot. Hmm. And I never told them who I was. <laughs> I just thought, you know, this is an indication of how, um, you know, how we look at the importance of individuals. Hmm. Right, the entire nation was rallied to ensure I got home, and then, you know, supporting Jeremy and the team that made it happen. It's incredible. Now, I mean, an incredible story, and to walk away with, I mean, relatively no injury, just to your hand. What would end up happening with your hand? So you had, so I got a few stitches, and uh, on the way back in the C one thirty, after I got a chance to hug the team and say thanks. And I had a flight doc, you know, on there because they didn't know what my condition was going to be, right? So they, sure. got, they got a full med medical. And uh, so it's me, the flight doc, and I'm standing there uh, sort of jotting down with my left hand notes so like because I know I'd have to do a debrief. Meantime, he's working on my hand, and I'm not paying attention. He stitches a couple things. The next thing I know, I've got a ace bandage wrap from elbow to <laughs> hand, you know. <laughs> I looked at him, I said, hey, doc, I said, you got like, Two band aids, <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> you know. I mean, and he goes, "Yeah, it's probably a little overkill, huh?" I said, "Yeah, I guess I'm your only patient on the airplane." <laughs> yeah, right? yeah. So uh, we got unwrapped everything, put a couple band aids on, and uh, I flew the next night. So it was minor. Yeah, I was going to ask how long, how long that, between that's, flights. That's that's what's remarkable, and, and you would have flown sooner, but you had to get your helmet refitted, and you know, <laughs> you know, uh, life support had to rebuild your kit. Um, and I just think about it, man, what a traumatic experience it must have been. And then you to just cowboy up and lead from the front and go, you know what, the only way that my fighter pilots are going to get behind that freaking throttle and take the, you know, take the fight to the enemy is if I lead the way. I just think it's absolutely remarkable. 
Yeah, well, thanks. I mean, uh, honestly, it was uh, my intent was to fly that night after I got back. And I met, you know, uh, when I walked off the C-130, and it was really a pretty special moment, you know, because uh, um, the, the formation I was flying with, the whole formation was there, plus everybody, a lot of people had gathered, wing commander, they'd gotten my wife, Dawn, and our daughter, you know, our oldest daughter, because our youngest was at a sleepover. And um, my wing commander at the time was uh, uh, Brigadier General Fig Leaf. You remember him, right? Mm -hmm. So Fig Leaf comes over and gives me a big hug, and he says, you know, I never got shot down when I was a nickel commander. <laughs> <laughs> you know, fighter pilot humor, yeah. right? Rub it in. And I said, uh, hey, boss, I said, uh, look, I know you haven't had a chance maybe to think about this, but uh, I've thought a lot about it. I ain't your young captain who just got shot down. I'm a squadron commander. I got to get back on the horse. I got to you know, put this behind us. The only way I do that is get back in the air. And I and and, and if you okay, with, I'm if you're okay with it, I really need to go home, get crew, us get back on the air tonight. He looked at me and he looked at Dawn and he says, "If she's okay with it, I'm okay with it." <laughs> wow, wow. So I uh, on the ride home, you know, Dawn was okay with it. She understood, but my daughter. Uh, and our daughters, you know, were still sort of going through the trauma of, okay, what just happened to daddy? Sure. You right. know, and yeah, so now you have this dilemma. I've got this obligation to my squadron to get back on the horse that night. In my mind, I got an obligation to my kids to make sure they're okay. And so I decided I'm going to take one night. So one night, make sure the kids are fine. They're fine. They're great. Uh, they're great to this day. Just incredible young women. And, um, and so I threw the next night. Wow, that that type of resolve is is seldom found. I feel like having the ability to you know hop right back in the saddle after something like that. I feel like these days we, we don't see that too often, where people they get hung up on on these traumatic events or or big big events, and they let that control their lives. And for you to not not skip a beat, hop right back into the saddle. I think it's I think it's a benefit that you provided your family a night. Well, you know, he talked about last last podcast, you know, about uh, a way of sort of quietly honoring the Vietnam vets. Absolutely. Right? I met so many, you know, Vietnam vets who got shot down like two and three times, yeah. mm -hmm. you know, over places like Laos. Yeah. Right? Dangerous. And harrowing, extra, uh, you know, rescues. And you know what they did? Every single one of them I ever met. You know what they did at the after they got home? Right. They went back to work. Right back to work. Right back to it. Just went back to work. You know, yeah. it was no big deal. It was no big emotional thing. It was just, yeah. hey, it's a job to do, yep. and let's get back on the horse. So I felt, in some ways, it was a very, uh, it was my individual way of honoring my dad's generation. Sure. Mm -hmm. And I think that goes a step further because you haven't mentioned it, and I'm gonna. Um, General Goldfein's father was the commander of the Triple Nickel, the 555th Fighter Squadron in Udorn. Udorn. Correct? A flight commander. Uh, okay. It's flight commander. All right. Uh, and, you know, and then, you know, years later, uh, General Goldfin becomes the commander of the Triple Nickel as well, uh, honoring that lineage. So more than just honoring, you know, the Vietnam veteran uh, community, uh, pilot community specifically, but, you know, taking your father, taking your, in your father's step, you know, the footprints and moving forward with that, I think is like, it's one of many, I mean, you could do freaking, you could do an entire season of podcasts on this guy. I mean, <laughs> I like that. just crazy stuff from riding his bike across the United States to, you know, commanding uh, the same squadron his father uh, was in, in, in Vietnam. And I'm not sure though, honestly, that dad was all that fired up about having one of his sons, you know, break the record of even number of takeoff commanders. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's not something you ever brag about. Yeah. Yeah. Always be one less, huh? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, so when you guys, how did you guys reconnect after the, those years? It yeah. was about a year after the rescue. We were doing, and I, I don't remember the specifics, but uh, there was a, a contractor that had come in and they, I don't know if it was the, Joint Accountability Office or something in D.C. where uh, the PJ team leader, uh, myself, and the flight leads and General Goldfein and then 3M or something, some outside contractor kind of narrated our discussion of what happened. Okay. 
Um, and that, so it was about a year after the rescue before uh, we actually reconnected. Yeah. You know, and that's when I asked him for it. So there's an old, goes back to Vietnam, there's an old um, tradition where fighter pilot gives his patch to the PJ that rescues him. And so it's like, hey, boss, can I get, <laughs> can I get yeah. one of your flight suit patches? So, oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's amazing. So you guys stayed in touch over the years and, and gradually grew in rank together. Oh, yeah. I'm assuming. Did you cross paths many times during your career? Uh, I would just say, from my point, uh, whenever we could. Yeah. It, it was honestly, it was pretty serendipitous the, the, the moments that we would reconnect. Mm. Um, you know, there, there were moments that I've discussed in, in a previous podcasts with you guys um, some of the, the struggles that I went through. And um, uh, here was this guy. Right there to, to, to save me. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to talk about that if you're yeah, open to it, Jeremy. Yeah, absolutely. But one of the things that I'm that I think is really really neat is um, I was giving a, a presentation at a um, uh, an event in Florida for caregivers, and General Goldfein happened to be giving a speech, and we're talking, and he's like, "Excuse me, I got to take this." Goes walks away on the phone, comes back, and it was Ash Carter telling him that he had been, uh, that, that his congressional uh, approval for the next, you know, the 21st chief of staff had been approved. Yeah. And I got to be like there. And then, uh, you know, a couple, maybe a week later, there was a thing on CNN or MSNBC or what, one of the news and Ash Carter was, you know, officially introducing. And he's like, and oh, by the way, he was next to Chief Master Sergeant Jeremy Hardy. And so I'm like, dude, I just got a freaking shout out from the freaking <laughs> Secretary of Defense. So, well deserved. Yeah. Well deserved <laughs> indeed. So, yeah, let's let's dive a little bit in um, about your experience. After you transitioned out of the military, you had some s several struggles that you were dealing with. Um, and how you guys reconnected on a totally different level. Yeah, I would say a life-saving level. Yeah. Um, well, it started in 2013. Um, I was the um, cadet wing superintendent at the Air Force Academy. So I had just had a, my second hip replacement. And, uh, you know, I was, for at least a year, not going to be able to jump or dive or fly. Uh, so I took this position trying to, you know, expand my horizons. Sure. <clears throat> And uh, my PTSD, uh, and I take full responsibility. I, I was, my PTSD had taken over. I had allowed it to take over. And um, the general that I worked for um, made a, a call that was, I believe to this day, the right call to make. Uh, that uh, It was time for me to retire. Um, but as an operator, as a guy who had spent his entire life running, jumping, shooting, Kill and saving. That was the mission. Uh, a year at the academy, um, which, you know, I kind of equate to babysitting college kids. Um, I, 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 was, I was an island. Like, I was the only operator. 4,000 cadets, 174 academy military trainers, 20 squadron commanders. <clears throat> I was the only operator. Yeah. And... Um, I don't know what happened. I mean, the general can can elaborate on that. I don't know what discussions happened. What I do know is that the general I worked for was pushing the chief's group to uh, retire me. And a phone call from the then vice chief of staff of the United States Air Force said, Jeremy's going back to Herbert Field. He's going back to Special Ops Headquarters. He's going around his tribe, and he will retire from there. And um, I left on verbal orders, which at the time, like, dude, tr you try and then process a base on verbal orders. They had no <laughs> clue what the heck I was talking about. Mm -hmm. um, and that was the beginning of my healing process because I was at rock bottom. I was borderline <laughs> suicidal at that point. Sure. Everything that I loved, the military career that I had worked so hard to build was crashing around me. And... Um, and, and walks the boss, and uh, he gets me back. 
That's amazing. Yeah. And that's just the beginning of, of, of the, the road up from there. Yeah. That's amazing. So, I mean, how, how did you come across this, Dave? Were you, uh, were you just keeping tabs or? Well, we had, Jim and I, you know, kept, t- kept in touch. We, I'd gone out and seen him a couple times, yeah. you know, on trips to the academy and uh, there was some struggles going on. But, you know, when it came time and I'd heard, you know, the, and the, the, you know, the commandant, I think it was, the superintendent reached out to me. Sure. You know, to get a courtesy and just said, hey, what's, what's happening? We're retiring. And so I said, all right, well, tell me, uh, tell me, you know, How's he doing condition wise? What have you? And it became clear in the discussion. There's a lot of concern sure. at the academy, you know, uh, about this. And so it was not uh, a directive at all on my part. Mm-hmm. It was more of uh, asking some key questions. So okay, so what are our what are our uh, what are the op- what are the options here for us in terms of you know proceeding towards retirement, but also giving him and the family the care they need. Sure, this guy is given so much. Um, and so we collectively came up with the idea of moving him back to Hurlburt, yeah. getting into the, with all of the resources that, uh, we had at AFSOC and in special operations at the time for dealing with this, just exactly this kind of issue Yeah, with the whole intent. And again, this was not, uh, I had no opposition, zero. This was everybody lined up and said, you know, and not because I was the vice chief, but because it was the right thing to do. Okay. Yeah. Everybody decided, okay, absolutely, let's, let's do this right and let's get him back to his tribe. Let's get the tribe to rally around him and let's uh, make sure that on that day he does retire, you know, his head's held high and he's able to, you know, we're able to celebrate his service the way it deserves to be celebrated. Mm. You know, and <clears throat> I am as blessed as I felt to be able to retire with my tribe. Um, I wasn't leaving the Air Force proud. Right? I felt like I was leaving disgraced. Sure. And I had no desire whatsoever. I didn't want any kind of retirement ceremony, didn't want any kind of shadow box, get whatever, didn't want any of the crap. Just look, man, you know, I've been blessed to be back here with my men. I get to go out with some semblance of, of grace, uh, but not the way I wanted to. And um, my best friend, uh, who I was living in Florida, obviously, and he was here in San Antonio, uh, he shows up at my door. And I'm like, you know, what are, what are you doing here? He's like, oh, you know, I'm here for a conference, whatever. He's like, hey, a friend of ours is having a party down at the beach on base. And I'm like, all right, well, that's kind of weird, but okay, let's go. And we pull in, and I'm like, well, there's my truck. There's my wife's car. There's... Oh, wait, those are my parents. There's <laughs> my best friend. And then there's Jeff Goldfain and Miss Dawn. And they gave me an impromptu uh, retirement ceremony on the beach. Wow. And um, it was like I got back a shred of my dignity mm. that, you, you know, um, it was amazing. And Powerful. I love you for it, brother. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. I mean, I uh, I think that was the next day we went sailing, didn't we? It did. Yeah. yeah, so we went sailing on on uh, Jeremy's boat. 40, how, many, how, how big was it? Uh, it's uh, 9.2 meters, so 33-ish feet. Yeah, 33-footer, so. beautiful sailboat, right? Well, at the time, yeah. I had taken up sailing as well, and we had a 27-footer okay. you know, back home, and I remember after this beautiful day, my wife looked at me and said, man, if you'd been a cheap mass sergeant, you could have gotten a 33-foot <laughs> <laughs> sailboat, you know? Now this little dinky 27-footer. Yeah. I said, yes, honey, I, there's no way I was going to make the cut for chief. <laughs> Dang it, Kyle. Not that chief, at least. Uh, man, yeah. in, incredibly powerful stories. And it's just crazy how many variables there are mm. in just years and years of both of your experiences, how it comes full circle and I mean, if you had lost your life there, where would your life have been? Mm-hmm. If you weren't there to help pull him out, where would his life have been? It's very interesting to see that dynamic. Yeah. And, and, and you know, the, the, the thing that, uh, and I'm not trying to embarrass you or whatever, but, the, you know, there, like I said, you could, you could spend an entire season, right? But when he was, um, when he was getting uh, promoted to general, um, my wife and I were invited to his home. And, you know, at that point, I was still struggling with my sobriety. And um, 
in his home, he had this beautiful, like, wet bar, kind of just cigar room, right? And so here's, you know, his brother, who's a general officer as well, and all these really important people, um, and they're all sitting around and, and drinking scotch and smoking cigars, and I'm trying to be a part of it, but I feel guilt, like I feel weird because I can't drink, right? So he goes and he pours, gets a, a, a little snifter, and he pours some ginger ale in it that looks just like the scotch that everybody's drinking. And he sets it down next to me so that I can sip on this ginger ale and not, he could see that I felt uncomfortable about that. Mm. And just, and, and, and that simple little act just speaks volumes of, of the man that, that you are. Well, I mean, honestly, thanks. But uh, look, I'm sitting here today because of you. So, you know, you didn't leave me and behind. And others, and a lot yeah, of others. That's right. Uh, you know, they didn't leave me behind, behind. I can't leave them behind. I mean, it's actually pretty straightforward to me. Yeah. Well, in, incredible bouts of service for both of you guys. And I tip my hat off to you, gentlemen, for, for everything that you've done uh, and done for one another as well. I could obviously see just sitting here the type of relationship you have and how much you guys mean uh, to each other. So thanks for allowing us to be a part of that and sharing a story uh, that is going to resonate with so many people. Yeah, thank you guys. Thanks for doing this. And thanks to Chef Irvine. He's one of my heroes. Yeah. <laughs> and not a uh, not a small man. Not right? a small man. And, the guy, and in pretty good shape. Yeah, the guy could lift arms more than people half his age. Yeah. It's, it's, it's crazy. So. Yeah, well, I got I to gotta link up with again and tell him I'm this close to the perfect steak. <laughs> I'm sure yeah. I love that. He'll probably have some pointers for you. I'm sure. <laughs> I'll be happy to test that out anytime in the meantime. You guys are always welcome. <laughs> yes, I shall try the steak out. Yeah, absolutely. You know, Dave Christian, again, I, you know, I apologize, especially, I mean, apologize. Uh, I'm thankful that, you know, that uh, I'm grateful that you brought me back on. Um, and I'm just going to, publicly throw out a little challenge Christian and I talked about it yesterday you guys the way you work together the way you interview is just so seamless and um, it just flows w scriptless flows uh, I think you should invite a guest on to interview the two of you because I'm sure that both of you have like just a plethora of awesome stories that your listeners would love to hear about. Well, Mr. Dave, what are you doing next week? Yeah. <laughs> well, I was actually thinking uh, of, of nominating Jeremy Hardy. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Go. That'd be great. You're well, welcome you know, on any time. I, I do have a face for radio, just like you. All right. <laughs> uh, so there's that. But um, I think it'd be great. I think it's, yeah. I think it's good content. Absolutely. You know? Yeah, we'd, we'd be more than happy to. We, we accept your challenge, Jeremy. Right. You, it. Yeah, you come on, interview us. We'll, I would, I would we'll love to. Chat. I would be honored. Fantastic. We, you like know, we would love to get your wife on as well. And oh, Miss Dawn is amazing. Um, something that would be really powerful, I think, to our audience is talking to a spouse that, that served 37 years alongside her husband. Truly. Um, 40 years, actually. I'm sorry. Yeah. You just celebrated your 40th anniversary. Yeah. Um, so even before the military, she knew you. <laughs> <laughs> which is incredible. So I'd love to have her out and we'll accept your challenge anytime. But um, again, gentlemen, thank you so much for sharing. Really appreciate y'all. Thank, thank you, you too. Thank you for your time. This has been the Medivac Podcast, ladies and gentlemen. If you need to uh, find our guests, it is David L. Goldfein and Chief Master Sergeant Jeremy Hardy. Give them a search. You'll find them all over the internet. Engage with this. Like it, share it with a friend or family member. This is uh, the, the important stuff we need to get out. Thank you always for watching, and we'll see you next week. Till next time. Bye.